God seems to just give me all kinds of different downloads, and I thought that I had taught this message before somewhere else, but now I'm not so positive that I have. But what I wanted to speak on was our plan versus God's plan. And I don't know if any of you are like me, and in the fact that we make our own plans, we think that we know what we want to do or what we should do or, or how something should be done, and then whenever we get into that, uh, we find out that maybe God had a different plan for us or wanted us to go in a different direction. So this message specifically was, uh, was created one morning whenever I was reading John uh, chapter 21, and we'll be going through verses 1 through 14 this morning. It's going to be a little bit different format than the last time that I taught uh, because this is more of like a a specific teaching on a set of scriptures here. Um, but I think that it's very applicable to our own lives. And I think that any time that we're reading the Word, um, God wants us to take it, read it in its content and its context that the content was written in, but then also apply it to our own lives. And how, how can we apply it to our own lives? Um, so if you would, go ahead and turn to John chapter 21. And... Uh, We'll get into a little bit of that, but the reason that this, this is so near and dear to my heart is because my wife and I, we actually, uh, we were on a course that we had set, and God, God even legitimately put us on this course. We knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that we were doing exactly what He wanted us to do, but then we had a preconceived idea that we were going to be going straight down that route until we died. Like, we believe that this was the call that God had on our lives from that point to the rest of our life. And I just want to encourage you guys that, that sometimes, no matter, uh, no matter if God called you on something or you just feel like that it's a really good idea and that's the direction that you should go for the rest of your life, that you shouldn't get stuck in this preconceived idea that He's not going to change your course for you. Because there's a really good chance that He is going to change your course for you. I was talking to Glenna this morning, and, and uh, well, actually, it wasn't talking to her. Uh, it, was, it was speaking with somebody else, but the, the point is, is we were talking about how, um, how God will, will take this situation that we're, that we're in, and he'll say, especially if you say, I'll never do that. I'll, I'll never go here. I'll never live there. I'll never whatever. He oftentimes says, yeah, right. Uh, he says, watch this. That's kind of what he does for me. But um, before we jump into the scripture, let's just pray real quick. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you will help us to uh, be open to your plan, God, and put it before our own plans and be willing to change whenever you want us to change. All right. Uh, this past week, a friend of mine made a statement to me, and he said, the world is not changed by your opinion, the world is changed by your example. I'll let that sink in for a minute, because we all have our own opinions, and oftentimes we're really willing to share our opinion, but we're not so willing to be the example that our opinion should reflect. And so that can be difficult, you know, especially whenever we believe that we're supposed to be doing one thing one way and, um, or that the whole world should do something one way, but yet we are comfortable. We're comfortable in the lifestyle that we've created for ourselves. We're comfortable in the lane that we feel like that we're supposed to be in right now, or even if we don't feel like we're supposed to be in that lane, we're just comfortable and we don't want to step out of it. We don't want to move out of it because... We're afraid of the unknown, right? And we're afraid of people's opinions about us a lot of times. We have our, our faith. We have our own, our own relationship with God, but sometimes we don't walk it out boldly. Sometimes uh, the most devastating thing you could ever hear is, oh, you're a Christian? I didn't know that, especially whenever you've known somebody for a long time. And I've got to be real honest with you. I've heard those words spoken to me. 
And it was devastating. Absolutely devastating. Wrecked me. You know? Because I believe that a private faith is a powerless faith. A private faith is a powerless faith. God didn't call us to be sitting at home, never going out, never sharing the Word of God with anybody, never encouraging anybody, never being that example of Jesus Christ to somebody. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. To everyone that believes. It is the power of God. The power of God. Man. I'll also tell you, the spirit of fear takes the power out of the powerful. We haven't been given a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. That's the spirit that God has put in us. Not a spirit of fear. You know, the Word also says that perfect love casts out all fear. God is perfect love. He is perfect love. And if you want to have less fear in your life, get more God in your life. Seek Him. Seek Him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. And I'll tell you, a lot of people, uh, and I've been guilty of this myself, to wish that I had more of God's power in my life, to wish that I had uh, the, the courage to walk it out, the courage to say something at a certain time to somebody that God has told me to specifically speak to, and maybe I didn't do it. I had that happen. I don't want to tell you the whole long story because it is a long story, but I'm telling you that was life-changing whenever God told me to specifically talk to somebody about something and I didn't do it. Man, I still to this day go, God, I hope and pray that you sent somebody that had more courage than me at that time because I know that God told me to speak to somebody and I didn't go do it. That's devastating, guys. It's absolutely devastating. But I will promise you one thing. If you want the power of Jesus, you have to have the attitude of Jesus. If you want the power of Jesus, you have to have the attitude of Jesus. You've got to walk it out. You've got to do what he did. You've got to get up in the morning. You've got to seek God's face and do what God tells you to do when he tells you to do it. You've got to be willing to go out and put your hands on the sick person and pray over them to see them healed. If you don't do it, it's not going to happen, right? I mean, that's what we've got to do. So... The way that this all came about, like I said, is my wife and I, we had to walk out some of this stuff. We had to go through some of these things um, in order to get where we are right now. And so whenever I was reading John 21, 1 through 14, it really just jumped out at me. And man, God just started speaking to me about different, uh, uh, different things. He was revealing different things to me. And so what we're going to do this morning... Like I said, it's kind of a different format than what I would normally do, but we're going to read through John 1 through 14. I'm going to be in the NIV whenever I'm reading it, and then we're going to just kind of dissect it a little bit so that we can, we can see what the Word says, and then we can see how to apply it to our own lives. So bear with me. I wasn't the uh, best reader in school, and I'm still not. So this is after Jesus was crucified. And the disciples are, are uh, still kind of in this limbo stage, and it's interesting. So he says, after Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee, which your version may say uh, the Sea of Tiberias if, if it's uh, um, specifically talking about the Greek, it happened this way that Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, and Thomas is, um, well, Denimus was, uh, was the Greek version of that word, and it actually means the twin. Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? Jesus. No, they answered. 
He said, well, throw your net in on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus, uh, whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off for work, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning, coals there with fish on it, and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and grabbed the net, uh, dragged it ashore, and it was full of fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he raised from the dead. All right. So you're probably thinking, what in the world does that have to do with our plan versus God's plan? Well, let me tell you. First and foremost, not foremost, but first, I would like to say that John, as he's writing this out, there are several things that just absolutely crack me up. And one of them is the fact that he lists out these five disciples, and then he says, and two others. Like they didn't even get a place in the... In the in the first. <laughs> like, that's hilarious. Oh, man. Uh, and then I'd like to point out the fact that Peter is still called Simon Peter here. He's still called Simon Peter. And if you all remember, Jesus renamed him Peter, and Peter means rock. He says, you are the rock on which I will build my church. So, at this point, Jesus has been raised from the dead. This is the third time that Jesus has revealed himself to them. So they have seen him twice already at this point. And then down, it specifically says that, uh, that they didn't recognize him. Yeah, he was 100 yards off. But if you know somebody pretty well and you've spent the last three and a half years with them, you're probably going to notice them even 100 yards off. I know that if I saw my wife 100 yards away, I would know that that's my wife. But Peter, to start this whole thing out, I think that he's still a little confused at, at, what, um, at what's really going on here. His whole mindset, his whole uh, understanding of what Jesus wanted to do and come to the earth to do, he hasn't formed it completely yet. It's not completely solidified in his mind yet. And so here he is, not real sure of what he's supposed to do. God has told him what to do. Jesus told him what to do multiple times. Told him in the very beginning, I will make you a fisher of men. Come and follow me. And at that point, he did. And we'll get a little bit farther into that in a minute. But at this point, he's still, he's still kind of struggling, trying to figure out, God, what am I supposed to be doing here? So he says, I'm going fishing. We know that he was a fisherman before, right? That was his job. That's what he did. That's what he was raised to do. He came from a family of fishermen. <clears throat> he owned his own fishing business, even. And then he left all of that to follow Jesus. And then Jesus is brutally murdered. But then he raises again from the dead. So he says, I'm going fishing. So he's making his own plans. He's doing his own thing here. Because he's comfortable with it. He knows how to fish. He knows that he can do that, right? But here's the deal. He took others with him. Whenever he threw that out there, others decided that they were going to go with him. And sometimes we want others to follow us and help us rationalize our plan. We want others to help us justify it. Others thought that it would be a good idea too. They were probably sitting in kind of the same boat that Peter was, right? And they're like, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's go fishing because right now we don't know exactly what we're supposed to do. They've, they've just, their whole world has been twisted upside down. I don't think that we can wrap our minds truly around what these guys are going through. 
their best friend for three and a half years, that they watched heal sick people, raise people from the dead, cast out demons, walk on water, all these different things. They saw him do that, and now the, the preconceived idea that they had of what they were supposed to do is totally twisted. It's totally gone. It's totally different than what they really thought that they were going to be doing. And we can see them in their life all the way up, I mean days, like the day before Jesus was crucified, they were still arguing about stupid stuff. They were still not getting the whole picture. They just weren't getting the whole picture. And that's totally understandable because they didn't have the Holy Spirit at that point in time. And the Holy Spirit hadn't descended on them yet at this point either. So it's, it's, it's somewhat understandable that they're trying to justify this stuff. The problem is our focus is on our needs, our wants, our desires, and not on God himself. Ultimately, that's... That is all of our demise. I know it's mine. Maybe I'm only speaking for myself, but believe me whenever I say, it's so easy to keep our eyes and our focus on ourselves, on our own needs, our own desires, our own wants, the things that we think will make us happy, the things that we know have made us happy in the past, but that happiness is only temporary. It's fleeting. It's here today and gone tomorrow. But that's ultimately the, the, the problem here with that. And just like Peter, we go back to what we know. At least I did, you know. Um, whenever God straight flipped our world upside down, I thought, well, shoot, maybe I'll go back into law enforcement full time. Glad I didn't. <laughs> really glad I didn't. But I knew that I could, you know. And God even gave me a dream specifically telling me, showing me that I could, I could make that decision. But in this dream, it was so vivid and so clear that if I made that choice, it would not be the same that I remembered it. It would be not fun like it used to be. It would be um, a lot of turmoil, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. The friends that I had, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even hang out with those friends anymore ultimately because I wasn't living the same lifestyle that I lived then, thank God. So I wouldn't have even gone back into that same thing. But the temptations would still be there. The problems would still be there. You know, people would still be trying to kill me like they're trying to kill all the rest of them. That doesn't really bother me so much. That was kind of fun. But just like Peter, we go back to what we know. And that thing that's safe and comfortable, that we know we're good at, we know we can do it. But I'm telling you, whenever God's called you to go do something else, then that something else is going to bring you a whole lot more fun, a whole lot more fulfillment, a whole lot more um, closeness with him. You know, because whenever you're walking in line with what he's telling you to do, you're setting yourself up for that closeness with him. You really are. So, in 2114, at this point, Jesus had revealed himself to them. Or Jesus... Um, had revealed himself to them twice. And if you, if you remember the first time uh, was the night of his resurrection after he had ascended to the Father. The next time was eight days later when Thomas stuck his finger in his hands and his hand in his side. I mean, that's got to be weird, man. If you think about that, sticking your finger in somebody's a hole in their, in their hand or sticking your hand up in their side, and you know he had to have been like, uh, and Jesus is like, no, do, do it, do it. And he's like, ah. and he's like, no, seriously, go ahead. That's got to be weird on both sides, you know, feeling somebody's hand stick up in your ribs or, and then sticking your hand in somebody's ribs. That had to be gross. I don't know. But Jesus had this, this new body. It was a new body. We'll get into that in a minute. So they got in the boat and fished all night long but caught nothing. They got in the boat, they fished all night long and caught nothing. We're talking about professional fishermen here. Professional. This is what they did for a living. And they fished on this same sea, on the Sea of Galilee. If you remember correctly, most of a large portion of Jesus' Life and his ministry was right there. But he called these guys off of, this, off of this sea. This is where they were when Jesus very first called them. It's where they were. And it's the very same sea that Peter stepped out of the boat and walked on the water to Jesus. 
think about what's going on in his heart and in his mind at this point. You know, things are all twisted up. He's out there fishing. And if you've walked on water somewhere, you're probably going to remember every single time that you go there, that you actually walked on that water. If you've done something crazy, something wild, you're going to remember every single time that you go to that place that you did something crazy and wild there. First of all, they were all scared to death when they saw Jesus walking on this water. And then they realize it's him, and he calls Peter out, and Peter steps out of the boat and starts walking on the water. It's this very same sea that he's walking on that he goes back out to. That he goes back out to whenever things change, whenever things aren't exactly how he thought. This is the same one, that he did something crazy that none of us have ever done, ever. I mean, if you've walked on water, and I don't know about it yet, please come and see me after this. I would love to hear that story. But isn't it amazing how hard the struggle can be when we're trying to do things on our own without his guidance? Even if we think we know what we're doing, the struggle can be very difficult without his guidance. These professionals couldn't even catch a single fish that whole night. Man, I don't know. That, uh, <laughs> it's, I can even sit here and say that's got to be frustrating. But you know what? I can personally say that's very frustrating because I've been there. <laughs> I've went out and tried to do something that I thought I was good at, but it wasn't the time to do it, and it didn't work out right. So Jesus is standing on the shore, and yet they did not know it was him. There's a couple things that I want to hit on here. First, first of all, Jesus had, had ascended to the Father and come back to them. And he has his perfect body. He's got the body that, that took all of the, the human aspects out, and now he's got his, his heavenly body at this point. So it's not that he didn't look like Jesus. It's just that he looked so much better than Jesus whenever he was in human form. They didn't even necessarily recognize that it was him. That's outstanding. But then, I think another part of it is that they were out trying to do this all night long. They're out trying to fish all night long, not catching anything. And they were, they were just like us. Sometimes we're caught up so deeply in our own plans that, that we don't even recognize Jesus whenever he's standing right there in front of us. Have you been there? I have. I've been there. But the Word says that he never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He never goes away from us. He's always right there. And sometimes we just don't recognize it because we're so caught up in, in our own stuff, trying to do it our own way, that we don't even recognize his hand right there, his loving face right there looking at us, wanting to spend that time with us. And here he is, and they don't even recognize that it's him. They're, he's only 100 yards away. That's not far. Jesus asked them if they had any fish. And this is one of the things I love about Jesus. He's funny. He's absolutely funny. And, you know, Brittany and I, we joke with each other sometimes. We're like, I bet Jesus, you know, is probably cracking up right now whenever we do something funny or stupid or whatever. And, uh, but he had a sense of humor too. This is Jesus. He knew they didn't catch any fish. He knew it. And he's like, hey, y'all got any fish? They're like, no. You know, that, that no that they responded with, it had to be like, who is this dude? Like, out there running his mouth. That's what I'd be thinking. I don't know if you guys think like that or not. But some dude running his mouth, wanting to know if we caught any fish. So he already knows that, that, that we don't accomplish, that we haven't accomplished the task that we set out for whenever we're, whenever we're trying to do it on our own. But I think the thing is, is he just wants us to recognize it and admit it. He wants us to admit it. Because there's power in admitting whenever you don't get it right. Straight up, there really is. It kind of takes the wind out of Satan's sails. It takes the wind out of our own sails too, not just Satan's sails. It takes the wind out of our own and, and it allows us to put our, our hope and our faith in him and it, it softens us up to be willing to finally accept what he's asking us to do. It makes us come to a place where we can say, you know what, you're right. I've tried it on my own. 
Obviously, I can't do it on my own. Sometimes that's a hard lesson to learn. Especially for me. I've had to learn it a few times. I'm still learning it. You know, whenever we recognize it and we admit it, it oftentimes could or should bring us to a place of humility and willingness to do what he asks us to do even when we know what we're doing or we think we know what we're doing. Then he tells them how to accomplish the task that they set out to do, that they set out to do on their own. He's loving enough to still tell them how to accomplish this task. He tells them to throw the net in on the right side, right? Miraculously, when they obey what he tells them to do, they're wildly successful. Wildly successful. But he's still proving a point here. Still proving a point. I'm going to jump over to, you don't have to if you don't want to, Luke chapter 5, verses 4 through 11. This is right whenever Jesus calls the first disciples. You'll see the parallel here in a second. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out, notice how the word calls him Simon here at this point. It's not even Simon Peter because his name hadn't been changed yet. Changing a name is extremely powerful. And sometimes it's extremely necessary. It changes your identity. It allows you to take on the identity how God sees you. Sometimes we need to take that name change. Even if the name change isn't your own personal name, but it's just from who you were to who you are, to now being a Christian, to being Christ-like, to being a follower of Christ. That name change is huge, very huge. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. If you remember correctly, this is... Once again, when Simon was trying to fish and hadn't caught anything. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled. We worked hard all night and took nothing. But at your word, I'll let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to all their partners, and the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so far that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus, fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. He started to realize what was going on and who he was dealing with. A professional that's out there all night long and didn't catch anything, and now this dude standing on the shore tells him to do it again and he catches everything. I mean, that's going to change your life pretty big time. He says, O oh Lord, for he and all who are with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. So they were partners in that business. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. Or other, like the verses we grew up with says, for I will make you fishers of men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So this is three and a half years previous to what's going on here. But that's how, that's how Peter, Simon at the time, started out his ministry. Was Jesus brought him back to the same, to the same place where he was before that. Peter's like, yeah, I'm going fishing. Then he realized... Probably one of the last times he did that, Jesus did the same thing. He did the very same thing. And it was Jesus that made the difference, not Simon Peter himself. So he tells them how to accomplish this thing on their own. And they were wildly successful at it. That's outstanding. But at that point, John, the disciple who Jesus loved, it's amazing that we're reading this out of John, and John's the one that writes it, and says the disciple who Jesus loved. You know, he didn't want to use his own name, so what, what else are you going to use, right? <laughs> the disciple that Jesus loved and then didn't name those two disciples. I mean, come on, man. What are you trying to do here? Cracks me up. Funny dude, I'd like to live with him. 
So John realizes that it's Peter, right? Or John realizes that it's Jesus, and he tells Peter. And at that point, Peter went all in. John was the one that recognized that it was Jesus, and John didn't jump out of the boat. He didn't jump out and start swimming to shore. He recognized that it was Jesus, but he still didn't jump out. You realize that John didn't step out of the boat and walk on the water either? But for some reason, Jesus wanted John to live a, a really long time. Most likely, whenever John was writing this, most of the disciples had probably been murdered at this point. I'll have to look that up, but um, there's a good chance that when this was being written, several of them were already killed. John realized that it was Jesus, and he told Peter. Peter's heart was in the right place. However, Jesus hadn't restored him emotionally yet. If you remember, Peter had denied Jesus three times, and that absolutely had to just crush the dude. Had to absolutely crush him, and he hadn't been restored emotionally from that. Yet still, whenever he saw his Savior, whenever he saw his Master, he loved him so much that he grabbed his cloak, tied it around him, boom, straight in, in the water for a 100-yard swim. That's a long swim, really, especially with all your clothes on, you know? I was going to be dragging you down, but he didn't care. He absolutely didn't care. So if you want to um, look farther into whenever Jesus restores Peter, it's in verses 15 through 19. We're not going to get into that today, unfortunately, because I absolutely love it, but we don't have time. As Peter's swimming to the shore, he's going after God, and he's going after God alone at this point. Everybody else is still back in the boat, right? Not that they weren't doing a good thing. They were doing a good thing. But he's going after Jesus with everything that he is. The other six disciples, they're following along in the boat, but they're dragging their catch in. They're dragging in the fruit of their labor. They're dragging in what God provided for them. They're working on that. But if you think about it, Peter said, all I want is you. All I want is you, Jesus. That's it. I don't care about the fish. I don't even care about the boat. I just want to get to you as fast as I possibly can. That's how much he loved Jesus. And at that point, he had to realize, man, I came out here to fish. I came out to try to do this on my own, but there's my Savior. There's the one I love that loves me more than anything else. The one that went to the cross and died for me. There he is right there, and he showed up, and he's given me the opportunity to still come to him. Even after I denied him three times, he's still giving me the opportunity to come after him. He still loves me that much. You know, whenever Jesus first sees Martha, he says, go tell my disciples and Peter that I'm risen. I don't know if you all have ever noticed that, but he says, and Peter. It wasn't because Jesus had separated himself from the disciples, but it's because Peter felt so bad about what he had done that he separated himself. Have you all ever separated yourself from God because you did something that you knew that God wouldn't want you to do? You separate yourself. God doesn't separate from you. He never walks away from you. I don't care what you've done. If, if he hasn't walked away from me, I can promise you right now he's not going to walk away from you no matter what you do. I promise. Peter denied him three times, and yet Jesus said, go get my disciples and Peter. And at this point, Peter's the one going all in after him, no matter what, all in. They're bringing along the fruits of the, their labor, following up, you know, pulling up the back. And it, it's interesting because Jesus asked for that specifically later, whenever they get there. He's asking to be able to utilize their catch, their, their fruits of their labor. It's pretty awesome whenever you break it down. But something that I think is one of the most important takeaways from this part of the, of the teaching right here is that it's a team effort. Even whenever we're in different places of going after God, I might be in a different place than Susie is, than Cheyenne is. I might even be in a different place of going after God than my wife is. There's been times in our life where she was going after him with everything that she was, and I wasn't. We were at different places. But what's interesting is that it's a team effort, guys. 
Yeah, we have pastors of the church. We have youth leaders of the church. We have us. We have people that clean the church. We have people that mow the lawn. We have all these things. But it takes all of us to get the job done. It takes all of us to do what God's called us to do. It's a team effort. These guys, just because they didn't dive in the water and go after Jesus, doesn't mean that they don't love Jesus. They love him. They absolutely love him. But they're just in a little bit different place. A little bit different place. And we can't look down on the people that are in a different place than us. And we can't look up to the people that are in a different place than us and think, I can never achieve that. Because you can absolutely achieve that. All that is is one decision in your mind. It's one decision in your heart to say, you know what? I'm all in. I'm doing it this way. I'm going this way. Listen to what God tells you to do and go that way. If you're doing what God tells you to do, it's okay if you're not doing it the exact same way that everybody else is. It really is absolutely okay if you don't go after him the exact same way I do. That's totally okay. That's why you don't look like me. You don't sound like me, walk like me, talk like me. That's fine. You weren't created to be me. You're created to go after him the way he's called you to go after him. But that's got to be with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's got to be. No matter what it looks like, you have to go all in. So then it says, whenever they got out on land, Jesus already had fish and bread cooking on a fire. That's another thing I love about Jesus. <laughs> They're out here working all night long to do something, and they get back, and the dudes already got what they were trying to get. They toiled, they worked their tails off all night long, and he's already got what they were wanting to get. And he calls them over. He's like, come on, come get some of this. He, I love when he does that, man. Because it makes you think. I really didn't have to work so hard. They didn't have to work so hard for it. They honestly didn't. The Word even talks about that. They didn't have to work so hard, but what they did need to do is learn a valuable lesson from it. And I think that sometimes whenever we work so hard at something... And we're putting in so much effort and so much work. And God says, hey, here it is, man. I'm just going to give it to you. I'm just going to give it to you. If you'd have just been seeking me, if you'd have just been trying to get it through me instead of through your own powers, you'd have already had it. I have no doubt that they would have already had it. You know, but at this point, they were thinking that it should have looked a different way. They should have got it a different way. So they wanted to get it on their own. So they had to go out and work hard for it, and they still didn't get it. Not until Jesus gave it to them. That's a very valuable lesson for all of us to learn, is that Jesus is our provider. He's Jehovah Jireh, our provider. His grace is sufficient for us. Jesus said to them, to bring some of the fish that you've caught. So he already had fish. He already had bread, but the thing is, he probably didn't have enough for the eight people that were there, right? So we had the five disciples that are listed out. Well, the seven. So the five that are listed out, and then the other two. So he probably didn't have all that prepared, but he had enough to get everybody started. Three and a half years, Jesus told Simon Peter to follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They were fishing for the wrong thing, people. That's a fact. They were fishing for the wrong thing. They were out there for the wrong purposes. They were out there to take care of themselves, not take care of other people. 2111. So Simon Peter alone, whenever Jesus says this, Simon Peter alone ran back to the boat he jumps in, grabs the net, starts hauling it in, right? Out of, out of love and obedience, he hauled the net ashore full of fish. They weren't just any kind of fish. They were large fish, the word says, and there was 153 of the large fish. Peter was probably a pretty tough dude, obviously. He was probably a very tough dude. No matter how you think about him, he, was, uh, he had to have been tough to pull in 153 
large fish. I think that it's cool, too, that they counted how many fish it was. Like, they get pretty in-depth in detail so that you won't think, well, it was probably a little net. No. There's 153 large fish. Simon Peter, I love, I love what this portrays. Whenever he sees that it's Jesus, he jumps in. He goes diving in. And now, at this point, there's nothing that Jesus can ever tell them to do that he won't be the first one to do it. That he won't jump in immediately and do it. You know, the other ones, they were probably like, oh, get the fish. Okay. They look up, and Peter's already there. Like, he's a, yes, sir. Yes, God. I'm definitely going to do that. And that's, that's a, a great example for us. You know, pe people talk a lot about... Um, his failure of denying Jesus three times. And they're like, man, he totally blew it. He totally failed. Now, I'll tell you today, I've totally blew it. And I've totally failed time and time again. But what's great is that he got back up. He kept doing it. The word says that a righteous man may fall down seven times, but he gets back up. He didn't just throw in the towel and be like, I'm totally done. Especially to this point, because... You know, a lot of people, they focus on him walking on the water, then they focus on him failing. But do you realize that even right after he failed, he led 3,000 people to the Lord? He was the first one to do that out of all of them. Right after that, right after he failed, right after he had this epic fail where he was holding it on himself. He was taking on that weight and that burden and everything. But God redeems him, and boom, he's back in it. We can take a huge lesson from that. We're going to fail. We're going to fall down. We're going to make mistakes. But if we obey God and we get right back into it, he will totally redeem us, so much so that we can go and change the absolute world for him. Change the absolute world. And that's exactly what he was, what he was starting to do. In every natural sense and circumstance, to have a catch so huge, to draw in so many fish, it would have absolutely tore their nets. It should have absolutely shredded their nets because just like the one before that we read about in Luke, it was tearing their nets, right? And they were bringing in so many fish that it started to sink two boats. I would venture to say that there was more than enough to sink their boat as well and more than enough to tear their nets. I don't know if anybody was using these nets. They might not have used them for three and a half years. Maybe somebody did. Maybe they got new nets. I don't know. But if they hadn't, they would definitely be tearing. But here's the point I'm trying to get at. If God tells you to do something, he's going to bring the supernatural resources to get it done. He told them to catch the fish. He allowed the net to not even break, even whenever it should. I don't care what the resources are that... that God might use in your life, but if he tells you to do something and you're obedient to do it, even if it seems absolutely impossible, he will provide for it. He's going to make it work. He's going to make it work, even if it doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense that these nets didn't break. Even the old good ones that they were using three and a half years ago, they were tearing, and they were commercial fishermen. They would have good nets. They'd take care of their nets, but those still tore. These did not tear because Jesus specifically told them to do it. They did it. They were obedient, and they were bringing it in, and Jesus wanted to be able to use that catch later, so he did. I want to make a, a very specific point. If God can get your attention like he did with them, he hollered at them 100 yards out. Got their attention. If God can get your attention, he can exceed your expectations. But you have to take your attention off of yourself. You have to take your attention off of your circumstances, off of your surroundings, off of the things that are pining for your attention. Everything's going to pine for your attention. Everything. Everything especially if you're young people these days. But everything is going to try to grab your attention. Everything's designed to do that. And when our attention is off of him, how are we going to be able to allow him to exceed our expectations? If he can get your attention, he will exceed your expectations. He will. One of the things that I, 
that I've had to come to learn is that I don't need my expectations to be financial blessings or, or for everything to go right. Because you know what? Not everything's going to go right. And you might not ever be a millionaire. Sorry. You know what? Being a millionaire might not be the very best thing for you. Because it says that, that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And I'm like, well, God, don't let me get rich then. Fortunately, right after he says, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So guess what? You can be rich and you can still enter the kingdom of God. He did follow it up with that. So if you're rich, congratulations. Just keep your eyes fixed on him. In 21 verse 12, Jesus says, come and have breakfast. Then he took the bread and gave it to them and also did it with the fish. He didn't just provide for them. He literally fed them with it. He took it, he prepared it, he cooked it, he gave it to them. He told them, go get some of that fish. I'm going to cook it up and I'm going to give it to you. But he did that. If you remember not too long ago, literally just probably a couple weeks before this, Jesus washed their feet too. He served them. That's what he was here to do is to serve. And we are supposed to be his examples, these, these living examples of his. We are to serve people. Jesus is sitting on the cross, literally hanging on a cross after being brutally tortured, and he still looks down and says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Yet I have a hard time forgiving people whenever they do crazy things against me. I'm working on it, though. Jesus served them. He cooked the fish for them. He cooked the bread for them. He gave it to them. That's absolutely outstanding. All he required of them was to trust and be obedient, and he provided the rest. All they had to do was be obedient. But how can we be obedient if we're not listening to him? How can we be obedient if we're not seeking him, if we're not setting specific time aside to spend with him? How can we be obedient if we're not willing to get up and say, God, today I'm going to do whatever you want me to do? because you know what's very best for me. That's the only way we can be obedient. Set some time aside, guys. Sometimes that can be difficult. It's interesting that they didn't ask him. The last part of 2112, they didn't ask him who he was. They knew it was the Lord. Again, all of his humanness had been perfected. They didn't even have to ask. They knew it. But they knew it by his actions. By his actions. Not just his outward appearance. We judge a lot of people for their outward appearance. I get judged a lot for my outward appearance. The look on my face. People are like, man, you're always mad. I'm like, I'm almost never mad. Almost never. If I look mad, I'm probably not. I could be super happy on the inside. Sorry, my face doesn't show it. So we judge people by the way that they look a lot of times. But... Um, but they didn't have to determine whether or not it was Jesus by the outward appearance, by the look, by the look, because he had been perfected at this point. They were able to tell by his actions, by what he was doing, by how he was talking to them, by the love that he was showing to them. We must learn that his ways aren't always our ways. His timing is not always our timing, and his plans are not always our plans. I mean, almost never are they our plans. And his timing? <laughs> have you ever heard the term... Um, Jesus is never early, but he's always on time. I mean, that, I can tell you story after story after story of where I'm like, come on, God, one more second, and I'm not going to make it. I'm absolutely not going to make it. And he says, eh, you'll be all right. His timing is not our timing. His plans are not our plans. I remember, uh, I think I may have mentioned this, but riding in the, back of a, in the back of an ambulance, had a bunch of bullet holes in me, and I'm going into horrible shock, bouncing up and down on this cot in the back of this uh, ambulance, and I was riding out of the hospital to get checked out. And I asked the, the medic, I said, am I going to make it through this? And he goes, yeah, man, you'll be fine. I used the, the accent because we were in the Virgin Islands. 
And uh, I thought, man, that's what they tell everybody right before they die. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to make it through this. Like, that, that essentially is a medic saying, no, you're not going to make it, dude. But anyway, his timing and his plans, it certainly wasn't my plan to be back there. I was pretty sure my time was up. And, uh, but he had different plans. He had different timing for me. I needed to go through that to get my eyes back on him. I didn't think about that at the time, but man, I guess whenever you're thick-headed, um, he has to use some extreme measures to get your attention. Hope you guys aren't as thick-headed as me. So, in closing, we must rest in him and allow him to feed us instead of constantly failing at trying to feed ourselves. It's an absolute must, guys. He wants to feed us. He wants to take care of us. We've got to give him the opportunity. So we're going to go into a little bit of worship after this. And if you guys want to stay, you can stay. If you want to come up and get prayer, you can come up and get prayer. Um, we've been praying for each other. So if you do have any kind of, uh, any kind of prayer needs and you want people to pray for you, I'm telling you, prayer absolutely changes things. It absolutely will move mountains. Puts God to work in our lives. I'm a living, a living testimony of that. So if you have something that you need prayer for, you can uh, raise your hand now. And if you do, everybody can kind of look around. If you see somebody with their hand raised, feel free to gather around them, pray for them, love on them. That's what we're supposed to do as a body of Christ is build each other up, take care of each other. That's how we show Christ's love. So we're going to go into a time of worship. And I'm just going to pray for us. Uh, if you need to leave, you can feel free to leave. Um, if you want to talk and stuff, you can feel free to go out in the foyer and talk if it's just going to be normal conversation. Just enjoy a time of worship, and then you're free to go.